The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, and welcome to another edition of The Engine Room. Today is a little bit special. We always talk about Ensemble being about the positive evolution of financial advice, and that infers that the the client or the consumer has uh, you know a great outcome. That can only come about when you have the positive evolution of a financial advisor, and as we know on this engine room, that only exists if the whole ecosystem is in sync. It is all aligned, one team, one dream. It's culturally correct, and it is doing all those checks and balances to ensure to ensure that that first stakeholder being the client is looked after. So we've taken a really interesting pivot today, and I'd like to uh, thank in advance our, our, our guest, um, who's taken time out of um, quite, a, quite a busy year to talk to us. And without any further ado, I'd like to introduce the lead ombudsman for investments and advice of the Australian Financial Complaints Association, um, Shail Singh. Welcome to the engine room. Thanks so much, Roxy. It's great to be here. And as we always do, um, we were talking earlier, and and um, uh, I always look at a bit of the back history. And for everyone listening out there, is probably thinking, "Oh, here's someone who hasn't doesn't really understand the coal face," quote unquote. Um, you spent a couple of years in a small financial planning practice, correct? That I did. That I did. So back in 2008, I I went through some career counselling, and uh, a few options came up. One of them was actually politician, believe it or not. One was financial counsellor and one was financial planner. And right. an opportunity came up at a suburban practice out in the suburbs of Melbourne. And I went out there to be fast-tracked to become a financial planner. Awesome. Awesome. So what but that would probably be like your, a PY year this, in, the, in the new co, yeah? Yeah. Look, that, what, what they were finding was that it, it worked at that time to take people from different industries and try to fast-track them into planning. I mean, the standards were very different then, um, but I was a lawyer. And um, they basically gave me a crash course in how to be a planner. And it really interesting, I suppose. My, my own journey was that uh, you got a lot further and a lot more successful in the law than myself. Um, I thought I'd be a lawyer and then worked out that um, uh, I, when I was introduced to financial planning, I just in, enjoyed that activity. So um, another failed uh, lawyer out there. And um, But before that even, we remarked earlier that um, you had an interesting, an interesting undergraduate. So I'd like to, I'd like the listeners to learn a little bit more about yourself. I'd like to learn how you've got to the role you're in today, the insights that you can add to the institution that you're in as a function of your history, and why ultimately you've come on this quite interesting podcast to communicate directly to all the people that you're looking after. Yeah, so, right. okay. yeah, a lot in that. Uh, so, look, I started back in the law in 97. So, I went to a big law firm. Firstly, I did a science law degree at the Melbourne University. I've done a master's in law as well, and I've got the advanced diploma in financial planning. But 97, I started in a big law firm, found that really wasn't for me. Blake Dawson. Blake Dawson, mm. which is now Ashurst. So, it's one of the top big five in Australia. Um, 
and uh, sort of wanted to go to the public sector, to be honest. And I got a job at the Medical Practitioners Board. As can, a can I ask why? Can I can I ask what 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 was inside you that that thought that you thought I'd like to work for the good of the general public? I just it was much more satisfying to help people rather than companies. Is what I what I found. Uh, I was in the IP section, intellectual property at. Um, Blake Dawson, as it then was, and helping big companies on patent litigation really didn't quite do it for me. So I wanted to find something where there was a bit more individual people's rights involved um, and and so found that in the public service. So, yeah. And you went into the medical uh, practitioners board, is that right? Medical board to start with. So it was a crash course in natural justice. As you know, with what we do now, natural justice and procedural fairness is a big part of it. Um, at the medical board, you had doctors who were getting their licenses cancelled, be allegations of, say, sexual misconduct, and you'd have to deal with those sort of matters. Um, so never a dull moment there. And, and how old were you? That's pretty – you're afraid of the deep end, I reckon. Just turned 30. Wow, Just turned okay. 30, so a while ago now. Okay. And um, at that time, then, you completed your Masters of Laws. Was there a speciality? Not, not really. I'd say it's more generalist, but I did employment law, defamation law, some of the IP subjects, but I sort of expanded out of intellectual property into employment, defamation, those sort of things. So not not more a generalist. I still was still struggling to find out exactly what I wanted to do, to be honest, at that time. Well, I think there's plenty of 30-year-olds, some of which are probably listening, um, who who are figuring out what their path is. And and, and ultimately, you know, you do best what you're most passionate about, you know. So, um, and then you took, and as we intimated earlier, you've, you've, you've then taken a bit of a pivot and you've gone, well, You've gone from a, a large uh, public organisation and you've gone into the smallest of all small businesses, a, a, a localised financial planning practice. And what is it that you were employed to do that? So I was employed really as a, I suppose you call it even admin to para planner to planner. That was a fast track process. And I did a bit of, bit of everything really. So I was admin at the front desk. I mean, I was serving people cups of tea, right? Um, which came as a shock after 10 years as a lawyer. Um, then I was doing the power planning, so I would, I would knock up the SOA, uh, those sort of things. Um, and then the idea was to sort of graduate as a planner and then service some clients directly in terms of we had we had about 100 mil um, under management. So we did the investment management side of it, but it was a lot of also Centrelink, super advice, TTR type strategies there. And looking um, at the time frame, uh, you worked there straddling the GFC, correct? Didn't know if my job would exist, to be honest. I, I, it was, it happened just at the time I got the offer before the GFC, and the GFC happened. I remember calling my boss saying, "Does the job still exist?" I didn't know how the industry worked at all. Uh, he was not worried in the slightest, and uh, said, "Of course it does." A very good actor, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as that he was, uh, and also like all of us, you know, it was it was it was really unknown. And um, so, in in the last twenty or thirty years, that was probably uh, the biggest exogenous shock to to generate uncertainty and fear, um, especially amongst people heading towards retirement. Um, have you got any examples of um, how you uh, saw your small practice handle people's fear? And, and what- that, is, that is such a good question. I, like I learned so much about this. I learned about asset allocation. I learned about the longer term strategy sticking to the plan. So I had so many conversations with people who were three years into a strategy saying, I want to bail, I want to go defensive. And you had to reassure them, market's correct, things will get better. And that was an extremity of it. So we we were really good at that practice and full credit to the practice, they still do it, in terms of coaching and educating our clients so that they could withstand things like that. We hardly lost any clients at all during that period. And I think the the key there was um, making sure that your plan initially was well done, well considered. Um, that uh, it handled all, all the variables, and most importantly, there was constant communication. Yeah, there was definitely no agribusiness. Definitely no agribusiness. No. Well, um, it's uh, it was re- it was suburban Victoria. Is that right? Suburban. Yeah. Right. And um, uh, you know, I I can't let this opportunity go. Um, I'm reading your website in front of me from 2010, and um, one of the questions we're going to touch on later on is artificial intelligence, and uh, on copy on your website is. Um, when you call us, you'll always speak to a person, not a machine. So that's now 15 years ago. And I'm wondering ultimately if human nature will stay in those swim lanes. Look, that's a really good question. I mean, we pride ourselves on that. And uh, we you, you would always be able to get through to a person. 
Um, and that was how we differentiated ourselves from the big the big banks at the time who were in financial planning. Um, we would personalize that. We would meet with you every six months. We would, if you had an issue, you could come and see us. We would make you a cup of tea, right? And um, yeah, I think we'll get onto this a bit later on, but I think that personal element of financial planning was something that attracted me to it. And I don't think that will ever go away. Your job's tough. Uh, you know, working at APCA and I, 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 I wandered onto the website today and I, I clicked on a link recruiting and you've got a lovely office, you've got a lovely vibe, but inherently some of the things day to day you you deal with probably um, uh, some of the less exciting and, and, and more um, dark elements of financial planning. What do you do personally outside of work to balance that for yourself? Yeah. Oh, look, it's a really good question. Firstly, you have to commit to balancing, right? I have a family outside work. Uh, I play golf, not to sound like a cliche, but here's one for you. I play in a, I play in a band. Oh, what, 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 what position are you in the band? I, I have electric piano, stroke organ, stroke uh, piano. Yeah. Oh, God, is this is an 80s synth vibe? <laughs> no, it's, it, I would call it more jazz. Uh, but they're, they're jazz takes on classic rock and roll hits. So, Oh, Kieran, Kieran, we're going to include the links. So Kieran's yeah. young guy uh, loves his music, so we're going to include the links. And um, I can only imagine the uh, the groupies you might get from the Australian financial place. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, it, it, it's about, it, in all seriousness, it's a great um, uh, hobby. It's a whole different world, um, and that's really what the, the work-life balance means to me. So I walk into a world where it's musos, where it's people who are – doing different stuff, writing riffs and songs, so my mind is completely off what I have to do day to day. You've got to do that. You've got to find that third space. You know, we've got to. So important. Uh, so important. good friend of mine, um, uh, Dr. Adam Fraser, he, um, he wrote the book Third Space and and uh, the role that you play and your, your, your extended team um, uh, would, would need something like that. And I suppose just, just changing gears um, – It'd be good to get from you, you know, the state of play of where you are today. We spoke off off air earlier around the number of complaints. You've got the the overall organisation is a massive remit, okay? And the listeners to this podcast are probably only going to be concerned in the scoped remit of which you're the head ombudsman of. So maybe if you can give us the helicopter view of the overall organisation, sure, um, and 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 where that scopes in for fundamentally the financial advisory component of it. Yeah, absolutely. So look, we start in 2018, amalgamation, FOS, SCT, CIO. Um, we got about 80,000 disputes back then. Now, fast forward to now, we're over 100,000. Dispute numbers have gone up. Bigger picture helicopter view, scams, unsurprisingly, is a big number. Um, is that, is that the, you think because the and just the eyeballs on social media, it's just so fruitful to put scams across social media. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think there are a whole, there are this is sort of a haves and have nots sort of thing going on. A lot of the have nots are uh, putting their full attention on these scam things and they're becoming more and more elaborate and more sophisticated. I don't think there'd be anyone out there who hasn't been impacted or knows of someone who has been impacted by scams. Yeah, I, I caught one two or three years ago, the, um, the Apple gift card, 50 buck one. So, you know, it can happen to anyone and the, the links they went to to defraud and to pose as someone else was, was remarkable. Oh, it, it, it is unbelievable and, and, you know, people get their, their super taken out, um, all sorts of things. So I, that's probably the biggest uh, general insurance type disputes, mainly natural disasters across Australia. And a big shout out to our, our Russian and, and a lot of the stands who are avid listeners of this. So um, probably, you know, um, it's, a, it's a big business year for you yet again. <laughs> that's exactly right, and, and and you know financial difficulty is is the other one that's there. Um, I think if you drill down to my area, we do uh, crypto is in my area too, so we get a few voluntary crypto members. But the advice trend is down. Uh, five hundred odd disputes in advice in um, investments and advice is about five thousand. But there's a couple of anomalies there that have resulted in a twenty two percent increase. So let me just unpack that. So for the year. 2022, 2023, there's, uh, give or take, 4,840. There you go. Yep. Um, uh, and that's that's a slightly above average, but, you know, we spoke earlier, there are, are some anomalies that we can unpack um, right now. Um, and you've you've resolved, I believe you've resolved about 800 
and 63 of those complaints as per your, your annual review last year. So what's the big anomaly? Why the difference? So we, we as you would know, there's a word called Dixon. Uh, we got a number of Dixon complaints come in. So that's not really a reflection of the trends of the industry. That's To me, that's a bit of a legacy type of issue, and that's as a result of ASIC putting out notices, uh, people being, you know, the compensation scheme of last resort being passed, the legislation. So um, that's why we got the big influx on Dixon. There's a second company that I wouldn't even call financial planning. It's called Best Leader Markets. Essentially, it's a CFD. So we're not including the links. <laughs> yeah, don't include the link to this one. Uh, but they're, look, without going into too much detail, they're CFD FX providers that essentially what they do, it's a pretty common trend, is they'll put a, a subsidiary out overseas. Uh, people will join the subsidiary company and end up on the Australian platform, but the Australian platform will deny any knowledge of that when someone makes a complaint which is why we spoke earlier, a lot of your complaints are Chinese, Taiwanese, non-English speaking, correct? Yeah, look, and it does it does raise the question of what we're there for. Yeah, it's an interesting scope, right? So, so um, and good luck catching those bad guys, right? Like that, that's, we want you to do that. But if you sort of normalized the balance of the financial planning industry um, and took them out, um, would we be up or down? Down, the- down. So it's about 500. Not many at all. 500 complaints. 500 complaints, okay. um, which is way down. If you go back even if three or four years, it was more like 3,000. And if you think about in the context of how many AFCA receives, which is 103,000, it's 500. So that's less than you know, 0.5%. And what's interesting on the, the notes, um, a lot of it is uh, failure to follow the instructions or, or, or the agreement. Um, and probably uh, quite surprisingly, um, not that much on the fees that were charged. Um, and the, the types, and and I read your your scope, and that um, you guys don't have like what someone charges someone is less relevant. Is it is it good or bad advice? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, well, that's right. So we we can't look at the level of a fee that's out. So you can charge what you want. We can't look at it unless it's misrepresented in some way or non disclosure. Um, so generally, we won't be looking at that. But what we can look at is whether there are any contractual obligations were, were broken. So you, you you charged a fee, you were unclear what the consumer would receive for that fee. That's an area. Um, but you're right, Roxy, it's basically about best interests and inappropriate advice are the main sources of complaints um, after failure to follow instructions. So remember that failure to follow instructions also includes the stockbroking industry. Right. And, you know, failure to follow the instructions to buy shares at particular times. Yep. That's a pretty hot area. Um, so in a financial planning practice or a licensee, that would be a, a, if um, you fail to buy something, you have yourself, you, you inform your licensee, it goes on your complaints um, register and you, and you figure out a way to remedy. Is that, that's, that's day to day? Look, that's exactly right. And we, we had, had some instances where, where licensees will try to remedy it. So you'd basically um, fail to follow the instructions they'd look at a sensible solution to that. So had the client bought the share, where would they have landed and make an offer based on that? So, um, yeah, that's the sort of thing. Yeah. Um, a fair bit happened um, around that. And and yet again, uh, on a positive note, um, geez, a lot of the complaints get resolved quite quickly. Ab- so, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's it, people sometimes, I suppose they're used to the stereotype of a legal dispute where lawyers are involved and, and whatnot, but just to be clear to people, and hopefully there's a lot of people who haven't used your services before. Um, you're not lawyers. You're not. It's not court. It's 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 got a, a process that that typically resolves quite quickly. We're very few going over a year. Correct. Look, it's it's such a good point, right? It's a good opportunity to explain what we're all about, right? Which is basically we're an alternative to the courts, and why we're an alternative is to make it easier for everyone and do it in a cost effective manner. So what that means is we don't want lawyers with 20-page submissions, which still sometimes happens, by the way, when PI gets involved. What we want is accessible service, discussions over the phone, trying to resolve the matter as quickly as we can. We use conciliation a lot to try to resolve. Decisions, binding decisions are the last point, and it's only about 10% of matters end up there. And um, you know something that, that is topical, and I will get out of the way quite quickly, is that um, – Sometimes there are there are firms that have um, got a lot of complaints, and they themselves, through either reality or, or, or strategy, make themselves insolvent. Which means that that as far as something that that can potentially pay for past sins, they just don't exist. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on sort of how you guys view that, 
maybe give us a context in in the current environment. And you did mention two groups, but I'll just focus back on on, on Dixon's um, and what you've done to ensure that that the additional costs don't spiral. Yeah, look, I, I mean, it, it is uh, – look, I've seen both sides of this coin, right? So you see the side where the consumer, the firm goes insolvent after really poor conduct. Generally, it's affected more than one, and so they make a commercial decision to either phoenix the company or just burn it, you know, make it insolvent. So for the uninitiated, um, and actually I'm very happy that there's probably a few listeners who don't understand what phoenixing is. Yeah, um, probably good what's, yeah, probably a good thing. What, what's the definition of Phoenix? Yeah, so what, what you do is you, you basically um, shut down one particular entity and then reopen the same business practice under another company and leave all the liabilities behind, in short. Yeah, so um, uh, not, 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 not an instruction manual, but um, if, you, if, if you're ever out there, and especially young advisors, and um, uh, you're potentially looking to, to move into a, an organisation, or do business with an organisation, and it, it does take it doesn't take much to do some research. And if they've done something like that, we're well, quite often with this smoke this fire. Yeah, that is absolutely right, and I really strongly recommend it. It is something that ASIC I think is aware of now, and is doing what it can to try to stop that sort of behaviour. But yeah, essentially, um, companies can do it. Uh, there is the CSLR now, as you as you say, the compensation scheme of last resort, and basically that covers personal advice matters, securities dealing. Um, it's got some element of um, mortgage conduct and credit, but not much. So basically, if a company goes insolvent, uh, in the past, we haven't been considering those matters. Now, if they're in the scope of the CSLR, we'll consider them uh, to, to um, for uh, uh, an application to the CSLR to get payment up to 150000 per claim. That's right. And, and um, you know, last year, the stats on that was there's 57 financial firms for insolvent as per your, your last report. But the consumer claim amount was staggering, just under seven hundred million. And but that was predominantly those one or two firms, correct? Yeah, you got to remember as well that 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 amount is not verified. So that's what the consumer is claiming of us, but it's not actually what we'll award. And so, and, and that's across all disciplines. And to cl- be clarified, to clarify, it's about three hundred and seventy million for financial planning. Yeah, that's right. So look, uh, uh, who knows if it will be that high? Um, yeah. Some of the cases are below one hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, some are above, um, but I do think that's probably the high end of what I would expect it to be ultimately. And um, what's so? Well, I suppose a couple more questions on the punchy data. Um, what's the strike rate? You know, like for for the uninitiated, as an advisor, am I always going to lose, or is a client always going to win, or like like is it a fate complete? Uh, what what are what, what's the data? Look, it's absolutely not a fate complete at the moment. It's sixty percent in favour of financial firms, forty percent in favour of consumers. That's sort of the latest information. And what do financial firms who are successful have in common? Very good question. Ultimately, I think what they have in common is good record keeping. Um, they have clear documentation to explain what happened, and sometimes they just have a vexatious complainant. Is the reality? A difficult person. Um, there are only certain ways you can get money, right? Uh, win the lotto, win at the uh, on the dogs, whatever else. Um, work safe, us. So very conscious of that. So sometimes you just get difficult people um, who are after some some extra money. But I, I think if you really look at it, what is it that they have in common? I would say uh, good record keeping, uh, clear communication, clear documentation of instructions. It makes all the difference. And um- the flip side is the people that fail obviously don't have those things and potentially their culture is just not where it should be. Yeah. Look, I, I mean, I, I think this gets to the nub of, of, uh, of a really good way to avoid disputes, which is ultimately to have a great culture. And what, I, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by it is not about – it's not about flogging off product for one, Right. It's not about a uh, number of sales. No, the industry's changed. It's about service delivery at a high level, really looking after those people. And and maybe internally within your culture, I mean, where I worked was a great example. We don't, it's not competitive against each other. You work together for the consumer's benefit. And we all bring, you know, we had a Centrelink specialist. We had an um, aged care specialist. We had an investment specialist where I worked. We all came together for the benefit of the client. And I think- um, that's ultimately what 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 makes the difference, and and you know you can see that in disputes ultimately. But you know we spoke off air, and um, 
there's always been culture in, in, in financial services, but potentially 30 years ago it was a product delivery culture. And today it's a, a service culture. And do you, what do you put as the, the, the inflection point on why you think that's, that's flipped? Well, look, there's a number of reasons. I mean, as you say, I mean, I, I, I was always taught we, it all started out of insurance bonds, which had a super component years ago. And then we moved into, you know, there were commissions and things. And so the, the remnants of the, the insurance bit always remained. And then it's been the government trying to catch up and stop all that conduct, right? Um, and now if you look at it, even though people will hate to hear this, I think the code of ethics has helped. Um, I think the education standard improvement has helped. And well, it has because people have got something to lose. I think we can't underplay that, okay? And there are there, where there's a high barrier professionally. I mean, you did uh, law and science, okay? I did a couple of undergraduates as well um, and some postgraduates. For a short-term windfall, I'm not throwing away six or seven years of my life. Absolutely, and and you know this is where this is where we're at right now. The fifteen thousand odd that are on the register, and probably there's only about thirteen thousand of those that practice. Two thousand are in compliance, maybe. So there's not many there, right? But those that are there, um, they've worked hard to get it, hundred percent, and they're ethical. Um, they're not generally the ones that cause problems. And we were talking about this before. People still do use the AFSL system and the AR system to flog product, you know, which is which is generally um, property development still happens. Um, things that the banks won't touch. Like what? Um, like uh, redeemable preference shares, which are very unclear what the ultimate fundamental investment is, like IPO type offerings. Yep. And they use an advice model. They still do it. Um, and I, But I do think they're pockets now, right? Where- and and does, it, does it really happen in like that much in retail or is it mainly wholesale? Uh, it's often wholesale, so often it's incorrectly classified. I mean, we get wind of it because it's incorrectly classified wholesale, and then we get wind of it. Um, but yeah, generally these are retail type investors that probably shouldn't have SM. I mean, it's generally you move them from a from a from a either an industry fund or a retail fund into an SMSF, then you have access to the capital, and then that can be used for whatever else it is. And that's how that's sort of the problem. And no mystery that SMSF um, complaints by number were the highest of, of the sector, correct? That's right. I mean, look, Dixon, Dixon's a big part of that, but yeah, there's a broader trend beyond that. Two questions. First question is, um, and we're going off piece here, so I normally should uh, give uh, um, the ombudsman the benefit of, of a bit of time to prep, but you know what? He sounds like he's gone okay. Um, this recent last year, they, they talked about um, increasing the limits for definition of wholesale investors, um, predominantly because a lot of real estate has just dragged people into that. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Look, we, we have made a submission to uh, Treasury on this. I haven't read all the submissions. I did read your 270-page report prior, but not the first submission. About a, so. Another 40 or 50 pages. Great. Just, just, just need some bedtime. Maybe the highlight package, please. Yeah. Um, look, the, the biggest problem we've got is that the 2.5 million uh, number doesn't really uh, – they're not all wholesale investors that have that number. You know, If you're in a house in Sydney or Melbourne, you can hit that number. And we've seen lots of instances – where people are two point five and they're not in that category, so we 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 just would suggest that I mean wholesales there to allow people to get opportunities that they can't get as a retail investor, right? So we just want the the test to accurately reflect that those people are genuinely wholesale or sophisticated type investors who have the knowledge and the ability uh, to understand what they're getting into and. Importantly, to learn that they lose retail protections when they do it. And we've seen numerous instances where people don't fully appreciate that. Yeah. And the second part of the question was that um, uh, that clearly that was something that, that ran true in Dixon's probably, if you reverse engineered a lot of the complainants, they probably weren't wholesale or sophisticated investors as, as they ended up being. Um, but just recently, uh, the, there was a, a lot of talk about how um, new – Financial plans were paying, you know, look like they were paying an ever increasing um, cost for sins of the fathers. Um, but uh, first of all, when did you in your organisation identify that this bill looked like it was going somewhere that was was hard to contemplate? And what did you do about it? Look, we've we've always been very transparent on the numbers. Um, so we've always been very clear on how many insolvent firms there are, how many financial planning firms that may fall within the scope of CSLR. 
Now, you've got to remember, I'm not passing the buck here, but ultimately the question of funding is, is a government question. Our role is to be clear with everyone and how much we think it is. And as you saw, we've, we've released that we thought it was about $300 million if, if it's advice related. What we did do, one thing we did do is once consumers had adequate time to bring their complaints about Dixon, we, our board, made a decision to cancel their membership. Now, we didn't have to do that because they'd paid their bills. So essentially, the only way that you get expelled from AFCA is if you don't pay our bills or you're in liquidation. Now, Dixon was insolvent, which meant that we have an option whether or not we see some. We decided it was fair to industry and consumers had had long enough to make a complaint to say, was in fact, tomorrow is the last day. And ultimately that- So I did say don't time date this, this podcast, but since you've done that, oh, tomorrow no, is right. the 28th of the 6th, it's the new financial <laughs> year, and you lose podcast bingo. Uh, well done. See, it's obviously not my expertise here. It's my first one of these, Roxy. Anyway, there you go. Um, but look, the, the long and short of it is we wanted to be clear with industry where the um, where the liability and the amounts were, um, and so we've got finality around a date. Awesome, awesome, and and thanks for doing that because um, uh, the financial planners who are doing the right thing um, have had a decade of, of uncertainty. So um, creating some certainty, yeah, um, is uh, is is a good, the best of a an interesting sort of scenario. Yeah. Um, when I'm talking about the, uh, uh, you know, your five strategic themes for the business, I'm reading them off here. First one is customer service. Be interesting to get your definition of what the customer is, but anyway, because we're stakeholders in the industry. We're well, you're customers yeah, too. Yeah. Why don't your firms are customers? Perfect. Yep. Um, efficiency, external engagement, i.e., what we're doing today. Absolutely. Data and technology and people experience. I'm going to start at the end. You've mentioned. Um, off air, something a culture lead indicator or a client first philosophy, and then work backwards. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, I think you've always got to put the client centre of what you do. You know, I, I think when you're talking about a financial firm practice, there's so many things you've got to think about. You've got to think about your fund, your platform, uh, your expertise, what service level you're giving. And sometimes I know it sounds strange, but you can lose sight of what you're there for. And for some consumers, all they need is a good cash flow management strategy, right? Which we've talked about. Um, sometimes they need very sophisticated investment advice, right? Um, sometimes they just need to be told, don't go into buy now, pay later. Um, so I think if you think about the, and this, you know, brings up all sorts of questions about scalability, about the regulations around, about cost of advice. But ultimately, if you think about what the consumer needs, and generally it's different things at different times in their life, they also, have different capacities to pay at different times as well, I think you can't really go wrong. So that, that's what I mean by that. Yeah. And um, one step further back, data and technology. So what I wanted to ask was um, you're big fans of the humans ultimately responsible. We are moving into an era where there's going to be more machine learning, more insights, more ability for financial planners to get their stuff checked by a machine. Um, I'm a, a, a father of kids at university, and the first thing they do when they submit a, an essay is, is run it through one machine, Matt, which says, has it been copied or not? Another machine that says this, another machine that says that. So in the education thing, it's 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 seen as like a core tool, um, not that prevalent in financial advice, but with the cost pressures on delivering people's engineering, which we specialize here, it surely will come. What's your personal philosophy on it, and what's the, the, the organization's take? Well, I think, you know, in in terms of um, financial advice, I think it'll always be a people game, right? So ultimately, it's person to person, helping the person, caring for the person. Now, technology can certainly be used to to assist with that. And I've just come off the back of the FAAA Roadshow where they've, they have they they were talking about some amazing things um, and amazing ways to do it. Whereas it can it can draft the file note, it can ask the questions, it can so it can save time, right? Um, and that's the benefit of it. I think where it goes too far is if it's providing the advice itself. I do think that it needs to be nuanced by a human being. Um, and I think there are limitations also around understanding some of the regulatory um, complexities around advice uh, that you see. And if you ask ChatGPT to see if advice is compliant with RG175s, how it responds is that um, go and see an independent professional, right? So I think there's a real use for it. In terms of AFCA, 
we're going through a data transformation uh, and and a system change right now, and really it's to make it the system more efficient. So financial firms and to answer your, your, your sort of the other question, financial firms and consumers are both our stakeholders, um, and to make it good for both in terms of providing information on the portal, having exchange straight away. So we're going through a whole system change where it's a lot easier, which will ultimately make it quicker. Um, and the data piece is really about trying to capture data that we then provide to other regulators to assist with regulation overall. And um, as far as technology is not going away, right? So, you know, the first incarnation of artificial intelligence for most of us was the um, seminal 1968 Stanley Kubrick film, um, which had HAL 9000 um, pushing around Space Odyssey, a Space Odyssey yeah. correct? Correct. So it's been been many years. It's always been in our, um, like a lot of things, science fiction then becomes reality. Um, the tools that come out, is there going to be a way in which not, not, probably not yourself, but do you believe there could be a way in which those tools would be able to be verified or or a panel of them that were, were, were endorsed or like, like the equivalent of, you're not ASIC, I get that, but ASIC approves PDS, is that, you know, it approves things. These tools that effectively check, it would be great to have a I suppose, a check and balance on them. Yeah, look, it's a really good question. I mean, I think it is ultimately more an asset type question in terms of compliance, but I think we're not far off a day where we'll get disputes where certain processes have been followed, certain AI has been used, and we'll be needing to check off on that AI, right? I mean, ultimately, we'll be looking at outcome. We'll be looking at all the things that we've always looked at, but I could see in the future that we need to have some technology to check those that other technology that's being used to provide the advice. So um, it's a good point. I mean, wh- and whether that's in a year, five years, or ten years, I, that's the unknown. Because I mean, that'll lead to systemic complaints. Absolutely. I mean, if, that, if some of those systems are, are wrong, um, there could be some big big dangers there. And if you look at the scalability of certain business models that you get. Um, I think that could be that could be a big one to watch out for in the future. And the conflicting um, realities of of um, everyone in Australia wanting more Australians to get financial advice against a shrinking pool of those humans, um, the quick fix may not be work. And and that that product failure of the AI might dwarf previous product failures um, in, in in the past. So. Safe to say, it might be a growth area in your business. It's, it's where you're painting a ro- rosy picture there, Roxy. But yeah, look, I mean, that, that's right. There is a real danger, and this is probably part of the, the danger of AI, that because you think you can scale advice, and it's really that below $1 million in terms of net assets that are even maybe less than 600 500 where the need's great, but maybe the capacity to pay six, dollars $7,000 isn't there. Um, and that's where you see the role for AI. So um, lots of volume. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that one plays out. We are in the engine room podcast. And a lot of people here are either um, advise within a, an ecosystem of their, their practice or, or are in the practice, either a power planning or administration. Um, let's, let's talk about the licensee landscape. And, and um, you know, there's been, you know, forests worth of written material on large licensees and, and perceived, you know, shortcomings and whatnot. Um, the smaller or self licensees don't seem to have had that much attention. Do you see the fragmentation of smaller licenses triggering spikes in complaints? Yeah, look, it, it, this is a well uh, articulated point, and a number of big licensees have raised it. Uh, we haven't seen the trend yet, but it's almost like what you don't see that's the problem. So, why are they leaving the big licensees to start up their own licenses? And then when they do that, how do we know that they're following? I mean, one of the key things that we advocate for, and we're not an advocate organisation, but one of the things we do advocate for is really clearly articulating to the consumer that they have access to EDR and they have access to AFCA if something goes wrong. So critical. And we don't really know whether that's going on. Um, I think there's a huge potential for that area to be problematic. Um, but I think, would, would most people's websites and whatnot should clearly do that. Most people's literature you just share. Well, you'd hope so. But look, we've seen instances over the last 10 years where people don't do it um, and then they don't know, consumers don't know they've got access. But look, as the awareness of AFCA goes up, and that's another metric that we're trying to work on, um, I think people will know from other sources beyond that. Um, but yeah, look, it's, it's, it's an unknown. It's an unknown. My take, and, and so 
you know, if you put your um, practice owner's hat on, generally the practices who go to self-licensed um, understand that they're taking on more risk. I mean, it's called a responsible manager. It's not called just a manager. Um, I find it very difficult to reconcile the fact that they would actively, proactively take steps um, if they're an incumbent business to do things that would land them um, in hot water. However, they lack resources. So what are the things that sort of a few hidden traps that through um, action or omission that you think practices could be guilty of that they probably need to address, especially the smaller ones? Yeah, look, that's a really good question. I mean, you've got to think about, I think, the licensee model and what it offers to people, right? And and it really does offer a number of things. So it offers a back office function often. It offers um, HR support. It offers all those things, um, uh, you know, in, in knowledge, pro knowledge, um, a, among other things. So if you think of those individual practices losing that back office and you work that way, you can see some of the errors already. So will they have the time to adequately research their products or can they outsource it adequately? Do they, I mean, do they have time to keep up with developments? You see how fast it moves in this environment. Even every budget, there's something new you've got to factor in, you know. Um, so do they have the capacity to meet those education requirements? So I know there's Kaplan, there's various things where you can train them, but is that enough? Um, and then there's the, the key one. I mean, how do you divide up your time if you're an individual licensee in terms of seeing new clients, you know, rainmaking for want of a better word, and then the back office function of drawing up SOAs which is a very time-consuming thing to do. Especially, I mean, you, you actually did that for, for a couple of years, right? It's harder than you think, I thought. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, great points there. And I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to plug uh, Ensemble in that we've, we're attempting to bridge a bit of that gap, especially for small licensees with our all-license PEA day that, that, that gives them a little bit of heavy lifting. Um, but do you see a correlation with, um, licensees that have got their um, internal dispute resolution framework working and good practice? Uh, 100%. So um, what does a good um, – well, I'm going to get the acronym IDR – look like? Very good question. Well, I can tell you what it doesn't look like. And, and five or ten years ago, you were seeing it, where basically consumers – I was shocked – to know, I won't name the names of organisations, but how little effort was being put into IDR. So by the time it got to us, we didn't understand the consumer's case or the financial firm's response. It was that basic. And I think there is a piece about being clearer on what the issue is. I think there's a piece about if you make a mistake, admit it. Um, and interestingly, where, where we've landed now, Roxy, is we, we get big, big, the big for like Macquarie Bank or AMP, rather than fighting us, they say, hey, we, we've developed this system in our RDR. What do you think of it? Which is exactly where we want to be. So I think- And how do they do that? Like if you, I, so one of the pillars is, is external engagement, stakeholder engagement. How have you as an organization made them feel like it's an open door policy to be proactive? Absolutely. Look, I think it's not just us. As you know, ASICs put out the, um, the expressions of dissatisfaction and complaints where you've got to start reporting on that. So if it's not if it's not reported, it's not sort of you can't change it. Um, so ASIC's taken some steps there, but ultimately we go out there explaining all the problems we see at the end, so that that can be incorporated early, right? And we're very upfront about being honest in your idea, being transparent, spending the time there because it will cost you later. Um, we talk about our conciliation practices as well. Um, so I think I think people are picking up on this. And they're realizing that it's actually a part of the cost of doing business. They're investing more resources into it in IDR. And what that ultimately means is paying attention to it at that point, rather than leaving it to the last minute where it's gone to an AFCA determination, and then they then they turn their mind to it. So I think that's a huge part of it. Sometimes when I see the um, the examples, you know, the, 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 the what's the best way of saying it? I, I see your horror films, you know, your little, your little sh short stories of, of what happens, um, they feel um, that they're always a little bit left to centre, but maybe that's, that's a good thing for me to feel that way. Um, what does a worse practice look like? Generally? Yeah. Um, and we're not editing this out. I mean, I mean, to be honest, you've provided me the least links because you're like, I won't tell you about that company, I won't tell you about that company, but what does, what's the avatar for a worst practice? And then possibly what are the quick fixes to turn that from a worse practice to 
not the worst practice? Well, yeah, good question. I, look, I always think one indicator of a really bad practice is when they fight us, right? So generally, a good practice will work with us to resolve disputes. So these are people that pay a fee to you who then fight you. Then fight us, yeah. absolutely. And, and you know, to be honest, they waste other members' money by doing it. Like, it, it's a real sort of um, problem. So and, and listen, it's got less over time. So if we see them fighting us and fighting hard and not being reasonable, that's generally a sign of a bad practice. Generally, the consumer comes to us um, as if they've been put through the ringer. You know, so they um, they haven't been their calls haven't been responded to. Sometimes there've been attempts by the financial firm to cancel the ongoing service arrangement. Okay, let's let's stop and unpack that. So so the clients made a complaint and they've just put their head in the sand or proactively. Somehow thought that by cancelling their commercial contractual arrangement, they did it all goes away. Absolutely. So it's, it's, it's a simple thing. Like you said, you've got kids at uni, you've got kids too. Ultimately, mine are year 10, year 12. Ultimately, it's about accountability and you teach them to be responsible for what they've done. And that is not always easy, right? But essentially, those sort of bad practices aren't accountable, aren't responsible, are antagonistic, will be right back in terms of development from the dispute. Whereas the good practices tend to be much more involved. Hey, Shale, this is what happened. This is where we think we stuffed up. What should we do? We'd like to apologize. Um, great. Yeah, they apologize. They will apologize for poor conduct. And uh, the timeframes in which you solve disputes, um, if what would you say? If, if it's open, honest, transparent conversation, can most disputes be solved in 30 days, 60 days? Is that the, the metric? I, I would say so. I mean, look, the, the, the service standard is ultimately 90 days, but I think that's right. I, I would say less than a month because ultimately they should be sorted out in registration in IDR. And then if they, they're not, as soon as the case manager is assigned to it, if the financial firm's up front, we can sort it out very early on. What I'd like to quickly touch on, we've scoped really hard on, on financial advice, and you did mention you've got cryptocurrency under, under your remit, and um, we will we probably just gloss over that for the moment. We've got a got complaints there, but but it's a big beast, you know. I, I, in another world, another hat I have. Um, I'm I'm in the mortgage breaking industry. It covers that. Um, maybe if you could give us just an idea of all of the coverages, because it covers general insurance, life insurance, and sometimes when a a financial planner is looking at the numbers, the headline numbers, um. It feels like there's more complaints than there are actual clients of financial planners in Australia sometimes. So, yeah. so maybe give us a bit of a feel of just of the other divisions of which they're not your remit, but why sometimes those those numbers and that correspondence from your organisation feels like it's overwhelming. Yeah, sure. So we've got a superannuation area, and really that's dealing with trustee actions. So generally, if your trustee is involved, that goes to that area. SMSFs are in my area, but trustee actions are in that super area. And that's death benefits, life insurance claims, some administrative things that trustees do. We've got my area, which is, we've said, timeshare, manage funds, CFDs, crypto advice, all of that's wrapped up here. Uh, horse racing syndicates, as I tell a lot of people, but we haven't had a dispute about a horse racing syndicate. But I don't know if you knew that, but if you have a horse racing syndicate, you need to be a member of AFCA. Did not know that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Well, there you go. There you go. Um, and then we've got general insurance. So general insurance includes travel claims, motor vehicle claims, household insurance. And so- you've been smashed with natural disasters on that, that division. I mean, if you're looking around your uh, your C-suite equivalent <laughs> in your lunchroom, and uh, they would be on the Bureau of Meteorology site fairly often, correct? Uh, look, it's it's a big problem. And the biggest problem is not so much the natural disasters, but the fact that insurance companies are just not keeping up. And they, you know, we talk about uh, bad practice in terms of financial firms. You see it a lot in the insurers, where people are ignored. People, people without rules on their their homes are not being paid entitlements under policies. So uh, it's a really, really problematic area. Um, then you've got banking, banking finance, which which includes transactions, unauthorized transactions, uh, you know, uh, inappropriate lending is all within that credit cards, those sort of disputes, and we have small business. So small businesses, um, essentially, it's it's often about loans, really, but um, we have a small business area as well. So like predatory lending? Yeah, that sort of thing is the main, okay. main part of it. Okay. So um, yeah, so I thought I'd just, 
I don't know that's a good it's a good point. The length and breadth of it because um when you look at that and you and you realize that um that financial advice um which is uh, something that's crafted over 10 20 hours is is bundled into the same um uh, sort of uh, umbrella as something that can be bought online in 30 seconds. Um, there's probably a reason why there's a difference of, of numeric compliance. Yeah, well, it, it, it's more by number, right? Because, I mean, 40% of disputes are insurance, really. And then you sort of got 30% banking and then super's about 15, 10 to 15. We, we're less than five. And then advice is even smaller. But it, it's small by number, but the impact's much different. It's a very different thing, right? Having a, having a motor vehicle claim versus having an advice claim worth a few hundred thousand. And when... The advice you gave, um, you inadvertently gave advice to best practices by identifying what the worst practices were. You see what I did there. Uh, getting on to acknowledging complaints, giving speedy and respectful communication to the complainant, notifying you guys as soon as possible. Do they notify their PI insurer at the same time or what's, what's normally the process? Yeah, they should. They should. Uh, look, but, I, but, but in saying that, once a PI gets involved and lawyers gets involved, sometimes you exit. Well, I think this is the issue. Um, a, a PI might have a very different way of handling the claim to a um, financial advice practice. And I've, in fact, been on panels with PI brokers who say to me, right in front of me, they say, when it goes to AFCA, don't admit anything. Now, I completely disagree with that sort of mentality. And to be, to be honest, Roxy, I think there is a bit of an issue there in terms of PI. They take a very legalistic view. They take a very antagonistic view. Um and, and look, I'm not talking about all of them. Some of them are reasonable. Some of them will offer reasonable amounts of settlement. But the short answer to your question is you have to notify them if it's above the excess. Yeah. But in saying that, can your organisation have an existential threat to their livelihood? I'm not sure. So a PI insurer who, who refuses to renew the PI of the practice effectively has killed the planet. Um, I'm not sure how practical and how easy it is for you to refer bad practice to a uh, uh, um, to be able to stop their business, stop that person from working, whereas PI can do it with the flick of a switch. Yeah, look, yeah, you've identified a real uh, sort of a difficulty with the system. I mean, we, we don't have PI insurers and members of us, right? So we just see the licensee. And ultimately, the lic- licensee is responsible for paying out the amount, then they recover it from the PI. So it's quite um, quite tricky, uh, but we do know the realities of PI. So what we do do is we do try to meet with PI. We bring all the relevant PI. I've met with every broker and every insurer that's involved with PI in Australia to talk about what they need to know, what are some of the challenges, um, how important the industry is, and at least we be transparent with them about where the industry is at, which hopefully will drive down premiums to what should be the reasonable amount for this industry now. Yeah, that's right. And so on that, what's your vision for the future for how, um, I mean, you just explained some friction points there. What's the vision for the future on on how you can um, clearly articulate a, a preventative mindset and a consumer first culture? Yeah, I think it, it all starts with your culture. And I think, you know, I hope to be doing many more of these sort of things where it's all about engagement. Kira, are we going to have him back? <laughs> Kira's nodding. He's not in. He's not in. So uh, there you go. Well, that's encouraging. But look, it's, this is a great forum, and it's also great to get in front of advisors because what it's about is prevention, right? And giving insights as to problems that do occur, <laughs> problems that do occur, um, and so planners whose mindset I think is in this space where it's more about trying to avoid disputes rather than have them later on. So I think what I'd like to see is even less disputes. Um, I'd like to see more, you know, even this this trend that we've got continuing. Um, and ultimately, that people have confidence. Really, what I'd like to see, Roxy, is people having confidence in the industry. And that's, you talked about ecosystem before. We play a big part in that ecosystem because if consumers know they can come to us and they've got a robust framework, a backstop, if things go wrong, that ultimately helps the industry because people are confident. In the industry, yeah, it's like when the banks were backed up by the government, the GFC sort of created confidence, didn't it? Well, slightly different. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about actually like you know bankrolling, of I'm, course. But yeah, yeah, you pre- the principles the same. Of, right. of course. Confidence. And you've heard it here first. Um, um, we, I know that there's going to be people um, who are listening to this who will have you, you would have scratched an itch, and you're probably the tip of the iceberg. There's two very um, vague um, re- references who want more on the ground sort of pieces of advice and 
a part of the engine room is learning about people's previous mistakes and how you could have prevented them in a business practice. But Jupiter would be good to continue the engagement um, with with the ensemble community on some on some grassroots things that people can do, because sometimes um, uh, licensees might be doing it, sometimes practitioners might be doing it. But if everyone's doing it and we're all growing the same way ethically and culturally, um, then I think we've got a chance. Absolutely correct, and and um, I think that's that's what we we hope for. So. Um, talking about various issues, various things that have historically come up. And I think, you know, there are risks even in terms of going back to the bad old days in terms of some business models. People forget about vertical integration, some of the problems. Um, so I think it's always good to keep those things in mind. Um, but as I said to you, I think the culture is fantastic now. People are receptive to trying to prevent disputes. Then when they have them, they're receptive to hearing how to deal with them. And I much prefer to play in that space. And with that as a final comment. I'd love to thank you um, on behalf of the Engine Room and the Ensemble community for spending time with us today. If it's your first podcast, you're not that bad at it, but um, on behalf of all of us, um, thank you very much for your time today, Sean. Thank you so much. Great to be here.